We good, Nick? Thank you. All right, grab a Bible. Turn open to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. And while you find that, I want to tell you the story from an Old Testament story from the book of Numbers. It's the story of a guy named Balaam. Anybody ever heard of the story of Balaam? Most of you have. And you probably remember in the story of Balaam, the, the big popular part of that story is that his donkey talks to him. You remember that? There's this guy, he's a king, and he's a, a Moab king, he's a Moabite king, and, and his name is Balak. And Balak, the king, hires Balaam and says to Balaam, come and, and curse Israel and I'll pay you this sum of money to curse Israel. And so Balaam agrees and says, I'll do it, but I cannot speak anything that the Lord doesn't tell me. If the Lord says it, I'll speak it, but I can't do anything other than that. Well, Balak agrees and says, okay, Balaam, say whatever the Lord has to say. Come and do it, and I'll pay you the sum of money. I just need you to curse Israel. Because he could recognize how powerful Israel was as a, as a force. And so Balaam goes three times and he tries to curse Israel three times. In the midst of that is when the donkey ends up talking. But I don't really want to talk about that so much. Balaam goes three times trying to curse Israel. Every time he tries to curse Israel, you say, what happened? What would happen when Balaam did that? He'd bless him. He wouldn't say a curse. He could only say what God would fill him with. And I had a youth member one time. I was a youth pastor for seven years and I had a youth member one time. He said to me, he said, what did Balaam do? Everybody talks about Balaam like he's so bad. What did Balaam do? Balaam said, I'll say whatever the Lord says. And the Lord spoke through him. The Lord spoke to Balaam and Balaam said a, a blessing for Israel. Why, was, why did Balaam do anything wrong? Well, it actually happens about five verses later. You see God is pronouncing these curses. And among one of them, among one that is named, is Balaam. Because Balaam did something. Balaam wanted that treasure of Balak so bad that even though he couldn't curse Israel with his mouth, he came up with a better idea. And he went to Balak and he said, Balak, I know how we'll do it. By the way, this part's not in the Bible. I'm paraphrasing this. We don't, we don't see this in the Bible, but we know, that we know the end result. Balaam went to Balak and he said, we know how to do it. And this we do know. He convinced Balak, instead of fighting against Israel, instead of fighting the Hebrews, send in your women and let your ladies marry the Israelite people because then the guys, because we're guys, will do anything for the lady and they'll worship the idols. And if the Bible says, that the scriptures say, the Hebrews know that if, the, if they worship an idol... God will, cur will curse them. So Balaam literally talks Balak into saying, hey, send in the ladies and let the ladies convince the guys to worship the idols and then God will do the cursing. I don't have to pronounce the curse. We'll get them to curse themselves from the inside. Today I want to make a very bold statement. There is an attack on the family. And it is not an outside attack. There is nobody coming to your door with a baseball bat or with a, a, you know, AR or something knocking on your door telling you that you have to destroy your family. Rather, there's an attack from the inside. We have convinced ourselves that God's word is not applicable to the American family. We've convinced ourselves that we're beyond that. Are you ready for Pastor Walker to just say the real plain truth today? We've convinced ourselves that in 2019 that women are past what we're going to read and that men are beyond what we're going to read. And we have switched roles. And you know that. I mean, with all the gender roles switching and all the open sexuality going on, we have removed what God has said is right. And we have decided we know what is best for the family. And instead, what we've done is brought a curse upon ourselves. And that's what we're going to see today is God's prescribed method. For the family. And that just how applicable it really is. And I'm going to say the plain truth today. And if you don't like it, I hope you brought your steel toes. Because I'm just going to say it. We're not going to pull, we're not going to pull what God says. We're not going to pull it out. And that's the whole point of expository preaching is that we don't get to skip the parts that get hard and get uncomfortable. And if you look around, there's more ladies in the room than there are guys today. So guys, back me up. Okay, so here we go. We're, <laughs> we're on Colossians chapter. Or don't get yourself in trouble, whichever one. Uh, Colossians 3 and verse 17. Do you have that? All right, read it with me. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, don't provoke your children unless they become discouraged. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we turn to you and we ask you as plain as we can to open up your word to us or open our understanding to it. God, we want to hear from you. And these people have gathered here today to worship you. I have nothing for them. I have nothing for myself. And I submit myself to you, Lord, and say, just do what you want. I beg you, God, in front of this whole audience of people to send us your spirit, to fill us with your spirit, not only in the building, but, Father, in our hearts, and draw us closer to yourself. Father, your word is living. It is true. It is accurate. And it is applicable. Let us see how to apply it to our lives. Each and every one of us. Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look with me at verse 17. Everything that you do, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Absolutely everything that you do, and Paul then goes on to give this list, this laundry list of things. He, he's been doing this lately. He's been giving these lists of things. Remember, he told us what to put off, and he told us what to put on, and he told us what to let in. And now he's giving us another list. He says, everything that you do, do it in the name of the Lord. What does that actually mean to do something in the name of the Lord? All right, I'm going to give you an illustration. A few years ago, I fell down my steps, and I, I snapped there was a snap in my ankle, and when I looked down, there was a, a softball-sized swelling on the, side of my, on the side of my ankle. And a side note to that, I was laying at the bottom of the steps. It hurt so bad, and, and Titus, my son, he ran across the top of the steps, and he was maybe four, and I said, Titus, 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 wait. Titus, go get my phone. It's, it's on my bed. Go get my phone in, in my bedroom. He goes, okay, Dad, and he ran off, and he never came back. And I crawled my way up the steps. I literally, crawled, like army crawled up the steps and I got to the top of the steps. And I think about that time Jenny saw me and I made my way to the couch. And she went and she got me a pack of ice. And I said, go get me a phone. I need to call your mom. She was at the store. And so I called Sarah and I said, Sarah, um, I think I might have broke my ankle. And so she rushes home and, and she comes in and she sees my ankle. Now there's a second part of this and I don't really want to hear it. I'm just telling you because you need to know why, where it's coming from. I don't go to the doctor. And when I say I don't go to the doctor, I mean I don't go. Like, I just, you're not going to catch me going. And say something else, but I'm not going to say it because I want to have an argument. Yes, I'm going to say it. I have assurance, not insurance. Anyway, so, so here's, the, here's the truth. I, I'm not going to go. I'm like, I'm fine. You know, what I, you know what bugs me most of all is to go to the doctor and get told to go home and rest. I don't need, a th I don't need to pay you $1,000 for you to tell me to go home and rest. Like, that's... I could have done that on my own. So I don't want to go. And so Sarah is devastated. And she says, you have got to go. You have broke your ankle. You've got to go to the doctor. And I was like, well, watch me not. We'll get some crutches. I'll be fine. She gets so upset that she called my parents. My parents came to the house. <laughs> my parents come to the house. My, I'm 30 years old. My dad's standing in my house. And he goes, Justin, you're going to the doctor. I went, no, I'm not. This is my house. I'm an adult. You can go. I had to tell my dad, politely told him. I said, you may leave. I'm not going. The whole night goes by. I'm not going to the doctor. I slept all night. Well, sort of slept all night. I was in a lot of pain. I wake up the next day and Sarah pulled out the trump card. She sat down on the edge of the bed and she said, Justin, would you go to the doctor for me? Come on. She knows I would do anything for her. And so she looked at me and she said, would you go for I know you don't want to go. Would you go for me? By the way, end of the story, I went to the doctor, I broke my talus bone. They said, you can't do anything about it, go home and rest. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yeah, right, that's all I could do. I knew I was going to waste my money going to the doctor, but that's not the point. The point is, I went because Sarah said, would you go for me? Here's the question I have for you. Look again at what Paul said. Read it with me. In verse 17, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Don't do it because you necessarily want to. Not because it's, it's your heart's desire to do this very thing. But do it because you love him. Do you love him enough to do what he's asking you to do, even when it's the thing that you don't want to do? Because as we read this list of things, none of them are very comfortable. And I'll, I'll get there. We'll see. We're, it's going to get real uncomfortable in a minute. But none of them are very comfortable. And in 2019, I'm going to be very bold to say, I don't think there's a whole lot of wives that like to be told to submit to their husbands. But I would dare to say this goes further because Paul said, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he went on to say, look at this. Look at how he said this. I won't stay long here, but just look. He said, giving, in verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Not only do it, but be thankful while you're doing it. Did you notice when I said that Sarah asked me to do it for her, what was my reaction? Fine. And I promise you, I pouted like a little 10-year-old boy the whole way there. I just mouthed off. Sarah was driving me, and I kept talking about how terrible it was going to be. I was not grateful for her taking me to the doctor to go get an x-ray. And I'm telling you that to say this. That is not how God wants you to behave. When you say yes to him, do it cheerfully because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Don't give your time, your effort, your money. Don't give your, don't give your, over your resources. Don't do the thing that, that you maybe don't want to do. Don't do it with a grudge because if that's the way you're going to do it it counts for nothing be happy that the Lord has chosen to use you for those of you who were in Sunday school this morning be happy if you're Ezekiel and the Lord chooses you that's hard right but yet that's what see, see how hard that gets when we get real practical but isn't that exactly what he's saying in everything you do do it in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the Father through him now let's get to the hard part. Somebody came to me on Wednesday. They said, did you, did you already read what you have to preach on Sunday? Do you like the way they worded that? You know you're an expository preacher when somebody says what you have to preach. I don't have to preach it. I get to preach it. But I do understand where they're coming from. They said to me, they said, what, how are you going to deal with that? Look what it says in verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. He said to me, how are you going to deal with that? Would you like to know how we're going to deal with that? Straightforward. And with holy reverence, just like we do any other text that comes out of the Bible, because God wrote it. I got one amen there. I get it. I know it's not a popular topic, but let's look at it. Wives, submit to your own husbands. Why do I think that that's hard? Well, I'll tell you why it's hard. First of all, understand this, because you live in a culture that has taught you all about unconditional love. But has said nothing about unconditional respect. And you live in a culture that has allowed women to degrade men as if somehow by degrading men that somehow that puts them in a, in a seat of power. I'm telling the truth, aren't I? I know this is hard, but it is true. Here's what we have in our society. Our, I, don't blame, I do not blame women who, who, say, who refuse to be submissive to their husbands who don't understand what God has told them because you have been surrounded by culture that has said, empower a woman, empower a woman, empower a woman. And the way that they have done that, I am not saying, do not misrepresent what Pastor Justin said today. I am not saying that women should be able to vote or go to work. or That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about being submissive to your husbands. When I say be submissive to your husband, the problem is that the culture you've been raised in has said this. Well, that puts him in power over you. That makes you his slave. That would make it so that he could use you. No, no, no. Protect yourself so he can't use you. Protect yourself so that he won't. Don't submit to him. That's giving in to an archaic society of binary roles. Well, let me tell you, take that nonsense that I just said and put it aside and look at what God says. Wives, submit to your husbands. There should be a level of respect when it comes from a woman to her husband. And the society you live in has told you that it should be you who commands respect. I'll give you a prime example. Who's ever heard the song from Aretha Franklin, Respect? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? Right, that song. Find out what it means to me. She's demanding respect. I want to tell you something. Did you know that there is a poll out right now for men? And this was the question asked. Would you rather be unsuccessful and alone and unloved, or successful and disrespected and not regarded. Thus far, the poll stands open, and it's an overwhelming 76% of men would say they'd rather be unloved and unsuccessful and unknown than to be disrespected and successful. 
For a man, ladies, listen to me when I tell you this. For a man to be respected is more important than to be loved. And I know that, that the woman's heart doesn't understand that. Because, by the way, in today's culture that's telling you we're not different, you are different. And you're made differently. And your thought process is different than ours. And I'm telling you, from a man's perspective, when you disrespect a man, it is hurtful to him. It would be just as much as if he looked at you and said, I don't love you. It would be just that hurtful. I sat in a counseling session with a woman and a man who were married and they were having struggles. And I told them about how a woman should respect her husband. And I promise you, in front of her husband, she looked at me and said, I love him, but I don't respect him. And I looked over and I promise you, her husband literally went and just sunk. And then she said things to me in front of her husband like this. She said, he's not the man I married. She went on to tell me all of the things that he doesn't do. And then when he got a chance to talk, do you know what he told me? He said this one sentence. He said, I'm trying to do everything for her. What she didn't realize was everything that he was trying to do that she wasn't paying attention to because she was worried about how he wasn't doing the chores that he, did, he was supposed to do or whatever it was, and they were having their spat. Every time that she made the comments to him about what he didn't do, she was disrespecting who he was. Come back to the song that I told you about, Aretha Franklin's R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Anybody know what year that was released? 1967. Did you know that two years prior, Otis Redding, who wrote it, released it two years prior on August the 15th, 1965? Otis Redding, who's a man and who said himself, go look it up if I'm not telling you the truth. Otis Redding, who said this, I wrote the song because I wanted my wife to give me a little more respect. Do you see the irony there? You're living in a culture that's telling you women demand the respect, demand the respect, demand the respect. But listen, you demanding respect does not mean you have to degrade your partner. You don't, have to, you don't have to bring him down to build yourself up. You see, a man deserves to be respected, and that's biblical. Let's look at a few. Let's look at a few. I told you we were going to deal with it very straightforward, so let's look at a few. If I can get my tablet to render there. There we go. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to, um, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. You're in Colossians, so you just move over one, two rather, excuse me, and go to uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. You have it? Amen. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives... Be to their own husbands in everything. Listen, we are not talking about master and slave. We are talking about roles. At my business, we opened our business 15 years ago. For those of you who don't know, I own a fabric store in, in Crestwood. And we opened that store 15 years ago as a three-way equal partnership between me and my dad and my brother. My dad had an accident at work, and me and my brother pulled with him, and we said, we're not going to let you go bankrupt. And all three of us together, 33% equal split, we all opened it together with the same amount of money, with the same amount of time. And I'm telling you, I'm jealous at times for that business. And I suffer from something. I, when I was 18, 19 years old, and we, were started, and we were talking about opening the business, and then right as I turned 20, we're opening that business. And so imagine being a 20-year-old with your mid-50s dad and opening a business. And so what do you think happened? Well, all the Oldham Countyans came in. They'd be like, I won't talk to the big boss. Well, guess who would puff out his chest and get really irritated? And I'd say, well, what can I help you with? No, no, I mean, I won't talk to the big guy. You mean my dad? Yeah, I won't talk to your daddy. Well, that would really, call him my daddy. That just really flies all over me. I would just, I would get red in the face mad. I'd be so angry. I'd go to my dad be like, they won't talk to you. And then when decisions had to be made, my dad and I are exactly the same. So you know what that means? Boy, we will just have it out. And we would fight and fight and fight over how we were going to make purchases or how we were going to hire people or whether or not we were going to move or whatever. We would just, I mean, we would duke it out hard. And a couple of years ago, I started to realize something. Everybody who came in wanted to talk to the big boss always had a complaint. It became a lot easier to just go, yeah, hang on, you want my dad, right? 
And then something else happened. I, I, and Sarah can attest to this. I just got to the point. I said, you know what? I'm not going to fight with my dad anymore about business. I'm just going to I'm going to submit and let him do it his way. And you want to know something? Our business is just as strong today as it was before and still growing. Sure, would my way have worked? Yeah, sure it would have. Did his way work as well? Absolutely. Am I still, even though to this day, I, when me and my dad start to go at it, I'll just go, you know what, whatever, do it your way. And I'll walk away and I'll just submit and let him do it. Did I lose my ownership? Am I still 33% owner? I didn't lose my ownership because I submitted to what he to what he wants to do. Somebody at some point has to submit. You cannot constantly have all the chiefs. And by the way, that is what society is trying to push on you. That you don't need your husband. And that your husband doesn't need you. And by the way, you're also being told, as we'll get to in a little bit, you're also being told that children have this, the same rights and, and, as, as a parent does. That's not true either. So all the roles have got all mixed up. Instead of just taking it God's way and saying, submit to your husbands. Respect him. When you disrespect your husband, it causes what happens next. And we'll get to that in just a second. See, because you're being told that a woman doesn't need a man and that a man doesn't need a woman. And by the way, you're also being told that you don't need marriage. Do you know what advice was given to me before I married my wife? Don't marry her, just move in with her. You know what everybody would say to me? They would always say, Justin, you don't, you don't, you don't buy a car before you test drive it. You know what my answer to that always was? I'm not buying a car. You're talking about a lifelong decision with a, with a lifelong partner and, and you want to do it God's way. Turn on your Bibles one more time. I just want to show you just one more time. Let's just see how clear God makes this. Set, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and 11. 1 Corinthians 11 and 11. I know it's quiet in here today because there's, there's hard things being said, but let's read it. 1 Corinthians 11 and 11. Did you find that? Here we go. This is God's word, right? Amen. Nevertheless, neither is a man independent of a woman, nor a woman independent of a man in the Lord. For as a woman came from man, even so man also comes through the woman, but all things are from God. Get it through, get it through this way. It's okay to need your husband. It is okay to depend on him because, by the way, he depends on you. The first time God said in the Bible, it was not good. Remember? The sun, it was good. The light, it was good. The trees, they are good. The animals, it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. What's the first time God said it is not good? For man to be alone. And so we come to part two. First is wives submit to your husbands. And then in verse 19, so I'm in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 19. Husbands love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Husbands, love your wives. Here's the problem for husbands. We talked about women, but guys, you better listen up because now it gets real serious for us. The problem is not that we stop loving our wives. It's the fact that we stop showing that we love our wives. Every guy that I've ever met who has a, 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 a girlfriend, he loves her. Guys become infatuated. I've said it this way, and some of you have, re have repeated it to me, that I've said when I was dating Sarah, I would have ate comment for her. You want to know how boys ended up eating Tide Pods? Some girl said, I like boys who eat Tide Pods, and some boy ate one. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. When a, when, there's songs about this. When a man loves a woman, he can't get his mind on anything else. He loves her. I'm telling you, when, when I met Sarah, I, I had saved up this money. I've got that little Ranger outside. I bought that when I was 16, and I had this big plan to put a giant engine in my truck. If I could make that truck do a wheelie, that's what I wanted to do. I never put that engine in that truck. You want to know why? Because I had a girlfriend. And I took every bit of that money and I, and I put it towards that girlfriend. Because I was just infatuated with her. You can ask Tom. I couldn't go like 10 minutes without seeing her. I'd call her on the phone. You, when, when we're dating, we seek them. We chase them. We go after them. And then when we have them, sometimes we start to let that go, don't we? I've been telling people in marriage counseling for the past few years, you need to date each other again. We are supposed to love your wife. And you have to show her that you love her. You remember before when you were dating, you'd write little notes. 
When Sarah and I first got married, we would take uh, dry erase markers and write notes for each other on the mirror because we work opposite shifts. And so you'd wake up in the morning and there would be a little note on the mirror that we would write those to each other, little love notes to each other on the mirror. Or you'd, you'd buy her things or you'd take her places. You would do things for her because you wanted to show her that you loved her. And here's what happens. We stop showing them that we love them and then they start disrespecting. Right? This is what I call the vicious circle. The guy stops showing the girl that he loves her, and then the girl stops respecting the guy like she's supposed to. Do you know what you never have to say if you're truly showing your wife that you love her? You never have to stamp your foot and say, I'm the man of this house. Because she will willingly follow you. That is a true statement. You will not have to. Do you know who says I'm the man of my, I'm the head of my house more often than I've ever said it? My wife. Sometimes I think she likes to get out of the responsibilities. Like the kids need a decision. She's like, well, your dad's the head of the house. Go ask him. I don't walk around having to say I'm the head of the house. You know why? Because my wife knows that I love her so much that I would do anything for her. So she, I, I don't have to demand it. Have you ever seen a leader walk around saying, I'm the leader. I'm the leader. You better follow me. No, people follow because you're the leader. You don't have to demand it. True leadership doesn't demand to be in leadership. True leadership is there because they have demonstrated to the people that are following them that in, some, in most cases they have demonstrated them they have their best interest at heart. Or at least they've given the person that idea. I've not met a man yet that looked at me and told me I don't love my wife. I haven't, I, I've fallen out of love with my wife without the wife first telling me that she doesn't respect him anymore. The two go hand in hand. Men, you show your wife you love her, and women, you respect your husband, and he'll keep showing you that you love him. And when one of you says, I'm going to stop doing that, what you're doing is breaking the process that God has given you. Let's read, let's read about the man side for a moment. Let's read this again. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. So you're in Colossians, you're going to go to the right. Go towards the end of the Bible, like you're going towards the Revelation, and you're going to see Hebrews and then Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Do you have it? Yeah. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be. Husbands, deal with your wife. And by the way, I had a sermon on this uh, recently. I think I've got the recording of it if you wanted it. But when Peter said the weaker vessel, it, you would need to understand that when he calls her the weaker vessel, that's not an insult. If you, if you had something, if you had like a fine vase in your house, would you not treat that with respect and, and honor more than you would the plastic dishes that you're not worried about the kids dropping? That's, that's what he means. Treat her with honor. Treat her. In other words, just the same as you want her to respect you, her, be, her being submissive to you and respecting you does not mean that you get to lord that over her. And it doesn't mean that you don't respect her. But every guy needs to pay attention to me right now. I told the girls this, I'm going to tell you it. Girls are wired differently than guys. And they want to know that they're loved. And see, the problem is we have taught the idea of unconditional love. Everywhere you look, go get a greeting card that says, Honey, I really respect you. You can't find it, can you? But you can find tons of them that say, honey, how much I love you. Your wife speaks a language that says she wants to be loved. And if you want her respect, you have to show her love. You have to treat her with honor. And she is going to show you the respect that you, that you so desire. But it goes even further than that. I want to read Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Look at Ephesians 5 and 25. I know I'm kind of going long on these things, but I think they're extremely important, and I'm going to show you why. Ephesians 5 and 25. I'm going to start reading. You can keep turning if you're looking for it. It's Ephesians 5 and 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man should, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And in case you don't understand that, which we'll go back to in a moment, but in case you don't understand it, look at verse 32, or 33. Nevertheless, in case you don't understand that, nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. The biblical narrative of marriage says this. Husband love your wife. Wife respect your husband. That's the part that we are missing. That is the part that society, and I'm going to be very clear. I know I'm a Baptist preacher and I'm not supposed to say things like this, but I couldn't care less. That's the part that the devil and his demons have sunk their teeth into really deep. And when we hear it, we say, ow, and we don't like it so much because that's not what you're being told. You're being told something different than that. To be told that the man is the head and that the wife should submit to the man and that children should obey, that is countercultural to what we know. But I want you to hear me and hear me very well. Marriage is so important because marriage pictures Christ and the church. Just as a man would chase after the woman that he loves, and if you don't believe that, go read Song of Solomon and you'll see for yourself. Just as a man would chase after the woman that he loves, Jesus so loved you that he came for you. And even more so, I thought it was a big deal to spend money on my girlfriend instead of my engine, but listen, Jesus paid everything for you. He paid with his own life so that you could have a way to the Father. You see, your marriage, listen, husband and wives, listen, your marriage pictures Christ and the church. Treat it that way. You want to give someone the biggest object lesson of their lives? Demonstrate in your marriage what Christ has done for you, how Christ has paid for you, how Christ loves you, how he has taken you in, how he keeps you. Jesus is your Savior. And this is what Paul said. He said, just as a man doesn't hate his own body, treat your wife just like you would your own body. Love her just that much. Don't, don't, don't take away her dignity by treating her as if you don't love her. Because when you start that, when you start by, by taking away that love that she has, then you start that vicious cycle where she starts disrespecting. And then you know what guys say to me? I don't love her because she doesn't respect me. Do you see? Do you see the irony? The woman says respect is earned. Well, no, actually it's not. By the way, all young ladies, listen to your pastor for a moment. This is why it's so important that you choose the right man to begin with. Because when you promised, when you stood before God and when you stood there in, in the pulpit and when you stood there with a pastor behind you and you held their hand and you said what? for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. And when you made that commitment, whether some pastor told you this or not, if he did his job, he should have told you that you're making a promise to God. That promise is not only to your spouse, but to God, that you will stay with them forever and forever, that you will not end it. Now, I know that that's hard because there's many people in the room today who have been divorced. And I want you to listen to me. You say, Pastor, what do I do? I've been divorced. I've already, part, I've already been part of a broken marriage. I want you to grab the hand of your partner and I want you to hold on real tight and you say, I'm going to stay committed. You can mess up. This is the beautiful part of what Jesus has done for you. You've messed up and he still forgives. And he is not done with you. And your marriage, even if you're remarried, don't you know that your marriage even right now can be a picture of Christ in the church and a picture of restoration? He can take what we have defiled and just like our lives, he can pick it up, clean it up, and make it new. I, I don't want to finish early. I want to, I, I, well, I know it's not early in time, but I don't, want to, I don't want to cut this out. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. Let's get to this one in, chat, in verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Here's the one part that we all need to hear, and all you young people really need to listen. If you're under 18, I want you to really pay attention to me. Obey your parents. Because this is fitting to the Lord. It's pleasing to Him. 
All young people, pay attention. I want you to answer these questions to yourself. Are you ready? If you're not 18, I want you to listen to this. Can you support the church with your money? Could you give enough money from your birthday money, from your allowance? Could you tie the 10% of what you take in? Could you keep the church operating? Shake your head no, young people. You can't. You couldn't do it. Could you, without your parents going with you, could you go on a mission trip? Could you go to Honduras without your parents? Shake your head no, because you can't. How can you young people who can't go on mission trips or can't support the church, you can't be a deacon and you can't be on the board, how can you serve the Lord? You ready? Young, ready, young people? Obey your parents. When you obey your parents, it is pleasing to God. And I want to tell you something about that. Did you know that Jesus was obedient to his parents? In Luke chapter 2, you get this brief little story. The only time you hear anything between the birth and his ministry. You get this brief little story at the end of Luke 2 where Jesus is 12 years old and he goes into the temple and he was teaching in the temple, but his parents didn't know that he was there. Remember that? And they go and they get him out of the temple. When they get him out of the temple, they, they pull Jesus out of the temple and he's 12 years old. And do you know what, the, what Luke recorded for us about Jesus? That he submitted to his parents. Here is the king of kings who's been born of a virgin and obviously has enough understanding that he knows he can teach in the temple. Because when they got him, they said, what are you doing? And he said, don't you know that I'm supposed to be about my father's business? But do you know what he did for the rest of his youth? And what he had done before that, by the way? He obeyed his parents. And let's take that a step further. All young people, pay attention to me. Jesus not only obeyed his parents, but he obeyed his heavenly father. I won't have you turn to it because I know we're running out of time, but I want to read this for you very quickly. Pay, pay attention. Young people, you listening? You're listening, right? Shake your heads. Listen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it, to be ro did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And listen to this. This is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus Christ obeyed his Father, even to the point of death. And that death was to pay for your and my sins. And so when God says to you, obey your parents, that is not an option. I know you live in a world that allows you to smart mouth your parents. I know you live in a world where parents are scared to spank your little bottoms when you're throwing a tantrum in the store because they're scared they're going to get CPS called on them. But the truth of the matter is you're not supposed to start the tantrum. Right? You, you can say amen to that, parents. It's okay. In his, thank you. <laughs> Somebody's kids getting in trouble when they get home. No, <laughs> listen. Obeying your parents is pleasing to the Lord. Jesus was obedient to his parents. He was obedient to his heavenly father. And thank goodness he was. Could you imagine if Jesus had said, Jesus didn't really want the cross very much. Remember, he was sweating great drops of blood and praying to God. And what did he say? Father, if this cup could pass from me, let it. Nevertheless, thy will be done, not my own. Now, I've got this question. As we've said that, I'm going to flip that on you and I'm going to say this. Go back to verse 17, remember? Everything you do in word or in deed, do it unto the Lord. Are you willing to do even the thing that maybe is hard to do because you love him and because you want to do what he's told you to do? Are you willing to be obedient to him? And I'm going to ask another question before we close. Have you been obedient to him in faith? Have you put your faith in him? You do realize there's a step of obedience that happens before you come to church. There's a step of obedience that happens before you walk an aisle or get baptized. That step of obedience is to put your faith in Jesus who died for you and rose for you. Did you hear that? Your step of obedience is to put your faith in Jesus who died for you and rose for you. And if you'll do that, he'll save you. Have you done that? Have you been saved in the name of the Lord Jesus by faith and faith alone? If you haven't, I encourage you as we stand up on our feet, do that now. Go to the Lord by faith and accept him, accept his gift of salvation. Everybody stand up on your feet and we're going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and thank you for your word. And Father, thank you even how convicting and how piercing it can be. And Father, I know that I'm not perfect in this regard and there are times that I don't show my wife the love that I should. And we're all guilty of, of not doing what we're supposed to do. But Father, I pray that right now you would just grab our hearts and turn us toward you. And Father, help us, turn, turn us toward you so that we can be a light in this community. 
Father, let the world see you through our family, the family that you ordained before you ever ordained a church or even Israel. God, the family unit has been destroyed. And the idea of family is so destroyed that some people don't even know what to say when we say, what is family? Father, I pray that you would reestablish, at least in our church, at least among our people, reestablish the true family that you have established, that you have called for. Father, we pray that you would just convict us right now. I pray that you would burden us. Search us out, Father, just like the psalmist said. Search us out, and if there's any iniquity in us, show us the way of righteousness. We pray that we'd be willing to follow. And God, I pray that if there's someone in the building today who has not accepted you by faith, who's not put their trust in you, who doesn't have your salvation, I pray that right now you would grab a hold of their hearts and draw them to yourself. Father, reveal to, the, reveal to them the truth of your gospel and the truth of your son, Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.